I'm back today with another video on some kernel lore. This one involves Linus himself, the founder of Linux, in which Linus does not like how the x86-64 microarchitectural levels are being named. So have you ever wondered why your Linux system runs so smoothly on a 10-year-old CPU, but it can also take advantage of modern hardware? Well, it's all about how things are built. To start things out and to understand why Linus isn't happy, we're going to start reading some of this email chain. On second thought, let's not go to x86-64 microarchitectural levels. Tis a silly place. Some of you might recognize this could be a little reference. Citing Monty Python like Camelot is a silly place. Anyways, I thought that was kind of funny from Linus here. And what is he replying to? He's responding to Arnd here. And he says, to allow reliability building a kernel for either of the oldest x86-64 CPUs or for a more recent level, add three separate options for V1, V2, V3 of the architecture as defined by the GCC in Clang and then make them all turn on config generic CPU. And this is what really throws Linus into a frenzy. The core debate here is, is over the microarchitecture levels, which we need to understand what a microarchitecture is. Microarchitecture is also called computer organization and sometimes abbreviated as microarch or uarch, which also stands for microarch, is the way a given instruction set architecture, ISA, is implemented on a particular processor. A given ISA may be implemented with different microarchitectures. Implementations may vary due to different goals of a design due to shifts in technology. So as that recent patch had introduced a K config build option for handling x86-64 microarchitectures, and it featured levels like V2, V3, V4, well, why do they do that? Well, now that we understand that there's different types of microarchitectures that can exist even within the same model CPU that has extensions on CPU instruction sets, well, that's why we have things like distinct levels. V1, V2, V3 is really just based on CPU feature sets defined by compilers, such as GCC and Clang. As Ard mentioned, but didn't get into detail, V1 just means basic x86-64 architecture or instruction set. V2 adds more advanced instructions like SSE 4.2, and V3 adds more advanced features like AVX instruction set support. So I think we can all understand why V1, V2, V3 doesn't make a whole lot of sense and can get convoluted because how does one know what sets belong to each version without extensively looking things up. Now, of course, this matters because it's all about balancing backward compatibility for older hardware and trying to optimize modern CPUs so they can effectively access new instruction sets. And for those of you who don't know, the x86 microarchitectures, I think it's fascinating on how many have existed in the past. We're going to get back to Linus in just a moment and his response on this whole bit of drama. But before we do, make sure to smash that like button for me if you enjoy videos like this. It gets more people to see this content and make sure to subscribe below. You wouldn't wanna miss another video in the future as we break things down here. So real quick here, we're just gonna go through the list. A lot of us are familiar with the 8086 in 1978. Then another one that I'm very familiar with is the 99 Pentium 3. We get into the famous Intel Core processors in 06 with some of us familiar with Skylake in 2015 and all the way down to the latest and greatest Line Cove in 2024. And one thing you can reliably see is how the process nodes have been getting smaller and smaller. From the 2015 to 17 era, we were working with 14 nanometers. Then we got 10 nanometers, and some of the latest are well below that. And continuing with Linus, the whole V2, V3, V4, etc. naming seems to be some crazy glib artifact and is stupid and needs a die. It has no relevance to anything. Please do not introduce that mind fart into the kernel sources. You can definitely tell he's very passionate about this one. He does not want this mixture of microarchitecture levels, but he continues by saying, I have no idea who came up with the microarchitecture levels garbage. But as far as I can tell, it's entirely unofficial and it's completely a broken model. Definitely speaking his mind, and going into saying there is a very real model for microarchitectural features, say this 10 times fast, and it's the CPU ID bits. Trying to linearize those bits is technically wrong since these things simply aren't some kind of linear progression. And worse, it's a simplification that literally adds complexity. Now, instead of asking, does this CPU support the CMP X change B 16 instruction, the question instead becomes one of what the hell does V3 mean again? So no, we are not introducing that idiocy into the kernel. Signed off by Linus. 
and while. So I want to break down a little bit here what CPU ID bits mean and why Linus is well correct in saying this is a much better idea than to just say V1, V2, V3 and have no idea what that actually means, avoiding some ambiguity in abstract levels like that V2, V3, V4. It just leads to confusion. So if we imagine a register and that register has a bunch of bits, we'll just say 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. For simplicity here, we'll just call this a register in a CPU. Well, this specific register could give you CPU ID information. Again, CPU ID bits. If we call this the CPU ID register, this register can help us understand information about the CPU's supported features and capabilities because it's organized in this register. If we just consider each bit a specific tell on whether or not there's a feature, for example, let's just say there are a few features such as EAX, EBX, ECX, and EDX. You can see the difference here is just A, B, C, D. And just to understand what these four are, it's just extended registers that may or may not be available in a CPU. So in the context of x86 CPUs, they're again general purpose registers with various operations. Now you could see whether or not you have support for these registers. Well, let's just say that EAX belongs to this bit, EBX belongs to this bit, so on and so forth here. A little bit of a mess there, but we can just call this the least significant bit. Next one up, next one up, next one up. So EAX could be here, EBX could be here, ECX here, and EDX here. Well, what's great about reading this CPU ID bits register is it tells us whether or not that feature is available. So in this case, we would have a one, a zero, a one, and a zero, meaning EAX support is available. This extended register is here and available for the CPU EBX is zero. ECX is one, so it's available. EDX is zero, so it's not available. And that's what Linus is talking about. This way of, of detailed querying the CPU ID, it returns information about the CPU supported features and capabilities without guessing because this register is clearly defined and tells you exactly what type of feature sets are available for the CPU. Forget about searching up what a V2, V3, V4 means and where did V1 go. This is a simplistic breakdown and understanding of how you can get the same information directly from the CPU and is just a way better way of keeping track of features. With understanding that, I think you understand why Linus is definitely not in support of the other model. And the drama and the conversation continues, but as Linus is known for his bluntness, we get more memorable quotes like mind fart and completely broken and his tip to Monty Python. Overall, I'd love to hear from you and what your thoughts are on this whole conversation. I think it just makes a lot of sense personally, and he's clearly just being protected of the kernel, trying to make sure that we don't go in some wild naming convention for which microarchitecture versions we're using. Anyways, the community also seems to support Linus's viewpoint on avoiding unnecessary abstractions in the kernel. This allows developers to remain flexible and simple in the way that they design the kernel. But this all invited us into seeing what the balancing act looks like while kernel maintainers go back and forth on how to maintain and keep the Linux kernel simple and compatible across architectures. Let me know what you thought about this all in the comment section below. Love to hear from you. Also, if you made it to the end, make sure to smash that like button for me if you haven't already. Think about subscribing. You've made it pretty far. You seemingly like the content. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching. Linux can be hard to understand, but I take the most commonly used terms, commands, and subjects in Linux and I break them down into simple to read documents, including Linux terms, flashcards, a checklist, a cheat sheet, and a mind map. And if you're ready to level up your Linux experience and knowledge, go to learn.savvynick.com now and get access to these sheets.